Hey gang, we are at Texas State Cemetery in Austin, Texas. And this is actually the second episode I'm shooting while I'm here. We were here in the previous episode to do the story on Josiah Wilberger grave. He was a man, he was probably one of, he was the first settler here with his brother and he was scalped by the Comanches and survived. But we're gonna walk from here to see another grave, actually the story and the man that brought me to really come here. And actually I have to thank Maureen McCarthy, who's one of our Instagram friends and subscribers who said, hey, why don't you go to Chris's grave? I'm like, oh, no brainer. Of course, that would always be on my list, but I have to credit her. Maureen, thank you for you know, bringing it up. It was not on my radar screen, even though I was coming to Texas. So let's go take a walk down there, down the hill. And we'll look at some more stones on the way. As I was saying in the previous episode, there are just tons and tons of veterans here and some famous people. John Connolly and Tom Landry. And of course, Chris Kyle just to name a few. And there are some beautiful stones here. This place is immaculate, absolutely immaculate. So I'm not gonna get too deep into the story of Chris, but we'll give a little background on him. He was born April 8, 1974 in Odessa, Texas, the oldest brother of two boys. And his dad was a Sunday school teacher and he was a deacon. His father bought Chris's first rifle at the age of eight. It was a bolt action 30-06 Springfield rifle. And then he later bought him a shotgun. He used to go hunting deer, pheasant, and quail. So he was pretty young. As many of the boys here or across the country are, are taught how to hunt. His brother and him, they grew up raising up to 150 head of cattle at a time. They were cattle guys and after graduating high school in 1992, he became a professional bronc rider and a ranch hand. All American guy <laughs> after graduating high school in 1992. And after that, he was a professional rodeo guy. He ended his career abruptly, though, when he injured his arm. He attended Tarleton State University for a couple of years, 92 to 94, studying ranch and range management. And one day, he went to the recruiting office. He was initially rejected because of he had pins in his arm from all the bronc riding and injuries, but he eventually received an invitation to get in there and he ended up in the SEALs, of course. And he was out in Coronado, California in 1999. So he did graduate and, and you all know, many of you do, I have some friends that are SEALs and it is probably the toughest program to get through. It's murder. The Rangers too, but the SEALs are worse. And I think the worst part of it I always think of is the part when they're in the, the water, locked in arms, the ice cold water. Anyway, all night. Man, if you can survive that, a lot of this stuff is nothing. So he got through it and graduated like a March 2001, 233, and he was assigned to SEAL Team 3, their sniper element. Sniper element, Platoon Charlie, later called Cadillac. So Chris did uh, four years of duty, and you can watch the movie, many major battles, many stories, and we know he made that long range kill shot. That is true. It's not the record anymore, but it's, it's just unthinkable how you could make a shot like that. 
And I think it was, as I recall, a lot of times what the snipers do, yeah, for super, super long range, like the world record right now, I think it was a third or fourth or fifth shot because you take the shot, you get it dialed in, you get your windage, your elevation, you get your, and I'm, I'm into this ultra high precision shooting. Even consider the cor, uh, Coriolis effect, is it called, of the Earth's rotation. You have to factor that in. You have to factor density, altitude, density and altitude. We pilots call it density altitude, but you have to do all of these factors to get what you dial in, which sets the crosshairs, which actually lowers the crosshairs. So you raise the rifle. And most of the time, you know, for these, these crazy mile, over a mile shots, you take a shot and you see where it hits, puff, and then the spotter will say up, blah, blah, blah. And then you'll take another shot until you hit your target. Hopefully your target doesn't know those little bees that are bouncing around them. Look at this. This looks like a Remington statue, doesn't it? Jones. Wow. I have a statue just like this with uh, an Indian on it with his arms spread. You guys, it's a Remington. You probably know the statue, but this is. Well, it says... Look at that, it's the spirit of Texas. The spirit of Texas 2 and 20060. It looks like it looks like that's the artist, I'm guessing. Anyway, kudos to that. Boy, you never know. You, you, this cemetery is just filled. Look at this. Let's just let's just pivot over here for a second. I, I didn't survey any of this. But this caught my eye. Cactus Richard S. Pryor died in 2011. Of course, I'm going to have to blur out his wife's birthday. I do that because ID theft. You never know all the people that watch this. I really don't like to show birthdays of people that are still alive. Look at that view, guys. Just stunning, stunning place here. So, I mean, he was one of our best snipers and he saved a lot of lives on Overwatch with these guys that were clearing houses and doing other missions on the ground. And as you saw in the movie, he did some of those missions too. Well, he came home and there were some adjustment problems. He had fame. And I'm not gonna again, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but we had these fabricated stories. I mean, I don't know if it's true or not, I think it is, but it started first one I heard about was with Jesse Ventura that he said he was in a bar and Jesse Ventura was mouthing off and they got in a fight and Chris Kyle knocked him out, blah, blah, blah. And then there was a story where I think it was a carjacking and there was, I, I don't want to get into it, but there were some stories like that that were coming out, I think. And, you know, you got to just figure, you come back with that. He had the book and he had the reputation and you're trying to, I guess, live up to that. And sadly, you don't need to live up to that. You have, you have your reputation. But anyway, whether it's true or not, and maybe some are and some aren't, maybe they're inflated, but that happened. And it really, it, in my mind, it didn't really tarnish his reputation. But it is part of the story. It's part of the, the discussion. Look at all those graves. All of those veterans. Wow. All lined up. Well, on February 2nd, 
2013, he and his friend Chad Littlefield were volunteering to take out a veteran named Eddie Ray Routh, 25-year-old U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He was from Texas here, and they, they took him to the gun range. He had post-traumatic stress disorder, and I think it was his, got this from the movie, I think, his mom begged Chris, can you help my son? And the guy was really messed up. And he was trying to do a good thing, the two, you know, the two guys, the two buddies. But take him to the gun range. So inevitably, not inevitably, I mean, to everyone's horror and surprise, there, I think the way it went down is they, he got mad. He was mad at them because he was in the back seat. And they were talking amongst, they were kind of ignoring him, he said. You know, a BS excuse. And they were at the gun range, and I think they went down range, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they went down range, and they were armed, I think, with pistols, to change targets, and they left him there with the rifles, and they're either turning around or walking, and the guy, the guy opens up and kills both of them. I think one of them, I don't know if it was Chris or tried to run back and but they were just cut down just brutal and there went a couple of heroes cut down well he went to trial this Ralph guy and he was found guilty of course they returned the verdict in less than three hours and they did decide that the guy had some big mental problems. So they weren't gonna seek the death penalty. So he sits in prison today. And I'm, I'm sure he'll never get out. John Wesley Jones II, Johnny Lamb Jones. Looks like he was a, a runner. Isn't that a great picture? You know, I wonder, I've talked about this before, these etched images in granite, and granite's a very hard stone, but when we were, I'm just gonna interject here for our cemetery, you know, it's mostly a cemetery channel, we talk about, when I did that episode uh, where the guy was uh, sandblasting, etching the stone in the field, it's a little different than this, but one thing I did notice when I compared it to the other stones that he had done or that were done decades, maybe two decades before, that finish was wearing off. And I can tell you that the finish on this is, I don't know what the measurement would be, it just etches the surface. So 100 years from now, I know granite is pretty hard, but I just really wonder, just like the people that did all the sandstone and marble didn't know back then that 100, 200 years later, it was all going to, it was all going to wear away. Well, here is the grave and unbelievably amazing stone of Chris Kyle right here. And that's Taya, Chris's wife. Of course, there's no date. She's still alive, but let's take a look. This is a beautiful granite. And I think I know this granite. I think it's Uba Tuba. Well, I'm an architect. This is kind of like, you can look it up, but this looks like Uba Tuba granite, and it is phenomenal. I used to specify this stuff. Very expensive. Look at that picture. Look at that uh, relief. Just, you know, you stand here and you just get goosebumps. And of course, the coins, there's coins here. The penny means you're showing respect. You have the nickel and the dime. Those are for servicemen that served with. And then the quarter means that you were with that, you were with that veteran when they died. Now, of course, these quarters, it's, it's just intent and respect. It's in their heart. And somebody left a beautiful stone here. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Such respect. 
such respect. Well, for me, personally, I think where I really get choked up and what I think about, of course, you know, Chris, man, you're a big hero to me, a big hero to, to our country and around the world. But really what stands out to me is the mem memory when I watched that funeral procession as it made its way down the highway from Midlothian to Austin. I think it was a couple of hundred miles. And you know what I'm talking about, the people on the bridges, the people lining thousands and thousands the whole way with American fl flags. <laughs> I get choked up. Sorry. <clears throat> anyway, that part really chokes me up. What a country we have. Anyway, it says son, brother, husband, father, the legend. And you are a legend, Chris. You always will be, and you will never be forgotten. Rest in peace.